The COVID crisis has many negatives, but this paper is about some of the positives that can come from the economic collapse that has ensued. It is about cities and how they can take up the climate agenda in a new way. Collapses have occurred before and economists like Schumpeter and Kondratiev have documented how they bring about waves of innovation which sweep through and create the new economy. This is a process that we uh, can document and show a happening now. So I have looked at what are the innovations and how they're going to affect our cities. The innovations appear to be three big ones and three soon to be big ones. The three big ones are solar with batteries, electromobility and smart city integration. These three fit together as a cluster which is what uh, Schumpeter called the innovations that make a big difference. They have to be something that is happening now and can easily be mainstreamed. And that is the case with those three. I have gone through the data on how not only are they ready to go and cost effective and attractive, but they are happening quicker. They are accelerating now. Those three are changing our cities. The other three coming are hydrogen, especially in industry, uh, circular economy and biophilic urbanism, which is how we bring nature more into our cities. These three are still developing. They're not quite there. They need a lot more demonstrations and they will change and we'll begin to see them more, but they won't be as dominant as the first three. What does it mean for our cities? I think there are going to be at least five or six things happening. Firstly, relocalization. We've already seen how centres, local centres, have become much more important. I think that will continue. These new technologies work best at a local level and they are modular and can be made to work in centres. So the city will be more polynuclear, polycentric. Each fabric of the city, however, is different. The centre of the city is different to the inner, to the outer, to the rural fringe, to the remote settlements. And each of them have their own way to use these combinations of technologies. I go into each of them. We'll have less car dependence. We'll have a lot more trackless trams, which are electromobility in a new kind of public transport. We will have a lot more electric micro mobility, which will enable us to do more, more local trips. We'll have a lot more partnerships that can enable the funding of these things to be done locally. And we'll have a touch of creativity, human arts and all of the things that make a city livable and interesting and creative. They will be very important for the future of our city in this transition period. Thanks everyone and welcome and thank you Peter for that wonderful video which has got us started for this evening. We wanted to start off with that so we gave people a bit of time to enter the meeting and we already have 127 people here which is fantastic so thank you everyone for coming along. So I'm Claudia Galois and I'm the coordinator of the Sustainable Cities campaign at Friends of the Earth. Firstly, just a bit of housekeeping. It would be fantastic if everyone could make sure you keep your mics muted so that we can reduce back background noise. And this event will be streamed on Facebook and we are making a recording as well. The recording will just be of the people speaking, so you don't need to worry, but if you don't want other participants to see your face, feel free to turn off your video. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we meet today. Most of us are tuning in from somewhere in Australia, which means we're on stolen land. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Indigenous folks who might be here today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. And as we work to fight for climate justice, we must continue to elevate the voices of Indigenous peoples. A really good way to support Indigenous folks is to pay the rent. 
You can do this by making a monthly donation to your favourite Indigenous organisation or at paytherent.net.au, which um, will be posted in the, in the chat. Whenever we're talking about major issues about land and our society, we should be involving First Nations communities. It's a shame we didn't have an Indigenous speaker tonight. We did reach out, but unfortunately, no one was able to participate at this event. However, our aim for the future is to continue to raise up Indigenous voices in the planning space. So tonight we'll be hearing from four speakers about the future of public transport post COVID-19 and the benefits of the Melbourne Metro 2 rail tunnel. Firstly, we'll hear the four panellists and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat box throughout the event as they come to mind. And for those of you following along on Facebook Live, you can ask questions by commenting on the live stream. As some of you may know, Sustainable Cities is a grassroots campaign run through Friends of the Earth and supported by the Public Transport Users Association. We're working with locals to stop destructive toll roads and direct government spending towards public transport options. This includes more buses, trains and trams, as well as active transport infrastructure like better bike paths and footpaths. Transport is a social justice and environmental issue. Without transport, many people are left isolated and don't have the opportunity to participate in all that Victoria has to offer. Transport is also the second largest and fastest growing to con contributor to carbon emissions in Victoria. So in order to rein in emissions, we must move away from car use and towards sustainable transport options. COVID-19 has changed the way we use transport. We're seeing more people walking and cycling, but we're also seeing more cars on our roads. So what does the future hold for transport in Victoria? And how do we move away from a car-centric way of thinking? And how can community voices be centred in the way our transport works? Well, I'm excited to hear what our panellists have to say. Following this event, we'll be holding a workshop on how to speak with your MPs about transport issues in your area, which Mia will post a link for in the, in the chat box. So, so if you're inspired to join the movement to fight for better public transport and cut carbon emissions, please do RSVP at the link in the, in the chat. So I'm really excited to announce our fantastic lineup of speakers who will take us through their thoughts on the future of transport in Victoria and how transport projects like Melbourne Metro 2 will help support our vision for a sustainable transport future. They didn't want to blow their own horns and were very, very humble in their bios, so I did a bit of digging and found out a little bit more about them. We're so grateful and honoured that they are freely giving their time, knowledge and expertise at this event, so thank you. First of all, I'd like to introduce Crystal Legacy. Crystal is a senior lecturer in urban planning at the University of Melbourne, where she's also the deputy director of the Informal Urbanism Research Hub. As a former recipient of the Australian Research Council DECRA Fellowship, Crystal has published widely on the topics of urban transport, strategic planning and urban policy. Her current research examines the governance and policy challenges of planning future urban transport and the politics of citizen participation in infrastructure planning. Crystal has been an ongoing supporter of the Sustainable Cities campaign and I'm honoured to have her as a presenter tonight. So please take it away, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, um, for that introduction, a uh, wonderful introduction, um, and to everyone for participating um, in this brave new world we find ourselves in. Um, I have been given the task of providing a bit of a frame for our discussion tonight. Um, and before I do that, I, I also want to acknowledge um, some of the, the great research that's currently being conducted here in Melbourne by some of our leading transport and planning academics around what the future might look like in a post-COVID Melbourne, Victoria, Australian city. So I want to acknowledge the work of, for instance, Ian Laurie and John Stone, who published an article in The Conversation on the 22nd of June, drawing our attention to the impacts of what, an, of what um, a, a, a mild increase in uh, car use, so a shift in mode from public transport may have on Australian cities and on Melbourne, calling, uh, calling to account the increase of congestion and really raising and drawing to our attention the possibility and the opportunities um, that we can see in terms of pop-up uh, buses um, and um, the expansion of commuter public transport. 
I also want to acknowledge some of the work by a colleague down at Monash University, Ben Beck, and Billy Giles Cortai at RMIT University, who have been advocating for stimulus packages that, that support increased infrastructure for cycling and pedestrian and, of course, open spaces. All of those things have become increasingly important to us during this COVID time. I also want to acknowledge some of the work that's also been conducted at the Center for Urban Research at RMIT, looking at and led by um, Billy Giles Cortai, looking at um, the shift in mobility patterns and what we're seeing is increased localism. As many of us are experiencing today, going to the local cafe to get your takeaway coffee and going home, really emphasizing this idea and really challenging this idea of what essential travel looks like. And perhaps we might be moving less in the city in the future, really pushing the agenda around support for the 20 minute city. Of course, that policy that was framed in Plan Melbourne, our strategic plan. There have been many announcements as well from local councils and Victorian government um, supporting um, the expansion of these ideas. Uh, most welcome recently, uh, Moreland Council in their uh, decision last week to put in place pop-up cycling. So as we, as we sit here in conversation about what now and what next for transport and mobility, I want to turn to a recent piece written by Richard Dennis in The Monthly. I have it here. <laughs> um, he's an Australian economist where he writes about government stimulus, and I quote, if Australia builds things that the public wants more of and we will need in the future, there's little chance that at the end of the crisis, we will be stuck with things we don't want or need. Economists have no unique skill in identifying which projects Australia should build, but luckily democracy does. If only we would put relevant questions to the public and listen to their answers. If only we would put relative, relevant questions to the public and listen to their answers. Well, what are those questions? And I might add, what parameters are we prepared to set when we ask those questions. I'm sharing this quote because it's relevant to our discussion tonight. On the agenda is the answer, Melbourne Metro. But what is the question we are asking ourselves? And more importantly, what is the imaginary we are prepared to ponder in which Melbourne Metro sits? And for whom is this future for? Who gets to decide this future? and who gets to decide what counts in the knowledges that both frame and inform those decisions. These questions matter, and they matter because transport planning, transport infrastructure provision, and future mobility is shaped through a process of what the post-foundational political philosophers describe as politicization. So not politics, politicization. Transport planning is about politicization. It is about priorities, it's about values, it's about ideology, and it's about power. What none of these things are is that they are static. They are not static. They ebb and flow, and we can see with the ex extraordinary responses to COVID-19, governments, how, how much governments can step outside of their ideological cocoon, cocoons and make policy to save lives, public policy save lives. We are, we are in a moment now where what counts, what is possible, and who, is, and who will benefit in our future is all up for grabs. We can disidentify from the symbolic order that structures and dictates our lives. We can use our collective political power to challenge the foreclosing of options and alternative futures for closing of options and alternative futures. That's really important for us to consider tonight. So on the table tonight is one possible answer and that's Melbourne Metro. But what I want to offer to you now is what questions are we, you, prepared to ask? What questions are you prepared to ask? What questions are you prepared to agitate for? And how might these questions redirect our transport and mobility pathways into a trajectory that resists growth logics might even resist 
the big infrastructure builds, may resist unfettered mobility, may resist jobs for job sakes, and the continued centering of automobility in the Australian city. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was a really fantastic introduction to the event and a really good bird's eye view of what is really important and how we have the opportunity to really reshape the way we think about transport and participation from, from the people who are going to be yeah, benefiting from it. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think also what you said about saving like public policy, saving lives at the moment, like it is so obvious and evident that the way our built env environment um, affects us, it can be a life or death situation. And we see that in, in toll roads and how polluting that can be and how that can seriously affect people's health. And we see that in active transport and sustainable transport, people's health is benefited. And so I think this is a really important opportunity for decision makers to be seeing long, how long-term effects and long um, short-term decisions can really have long-term benefits for people's health um, and it is, it is a public health issue as well, the way that we get around, the way we move around and how, um, how we interact with our built environment. So thank you so much for giving us that structure to begin the event. And um, it sounds like there's already a couple of questions for you. So I look forward to the, the discussion at the end. So next off, I would like to invite um, Peter Newman, who is the Professor of Sustainability at Curtin University in Perth, Australia. Peter is an academic who's written 20 books and over 350 papers on sustainable cities with a global reputation and has worked to deliver his ideas in all levels of government. Peter has worked in local government as an elected councillor in Fremantle, in Western Australia's state government as an advisor to three premiers, and in the Australian government on the board of Infrastructure Australia and the Prime Minister's City Reference Group. He is the coordinating lead author of the UN's IPCC on transport. And in 2018 to 19, he was the WA Scientist of the Year. He is editor in chief of the Spr Springer Journal, Sustainable Earth. And I'm pr particularly impressed by his contributions to urban design and sustainable transport in saving and rebuilding Perth's rail system in 2014, for which he was awarded an Order of Australia. So take it away, Peter, thank you. You're just on mute. Sorry, say it again. Uh, thank you, and um, I, uh, you've already seen a little bit of me with the uh, uh, first video, which was in fact an abstract, which journals now ask you to do, uh, with, of a paper called uh, COVID Climate and Cities, uh, in urban science. So let me um, proceed through these slides, if I can make it work. There we go. So 2020 has not been great so far, has it? Um, began with the apocalypse and um, the Australian apocalypse, which was deeply disturbing and uh, uh, is, is, is getting um, now into the COVID situation where the world began to fall apart and we started to see the end of the economy as we know it, 600,000 jobs lost. So this forms the backdrop to what I want to say because the paper that I wrote and which I talked about in that little video was about the transitions that have been studied in the past. There have been five big waves of innovation in the past which have come out of economic collapses. The 1840s, the 1890s, the 1930s, and the late uh, 80s and 90s, there was a, um, a big recession that led to the um, digital networks that we've now got. And each of these waves have involved innovations that have changed our cities. The wave we've still going through really the fourth wave um, is, is one about cars, trucks, planes, fossil fuels. And we're really struggling now to get out of that era. So the sixth wave as um, I've set out here is a, a series of potential innovations. 
And what I've done in this paper is try to show that there are a series of these that are happening, which are um, three that are big ones and three that are likely to be coming a bit later and a bit slower. The big ones have already started. They are renewables, electromobility and smart cities, and they fit together and they are mainstreaming very rapidly and accelerating. The uh, level one, as they're described in this um, Gilles idea of transition theory, uh, hydrogen, especially for industry, the circular economy, biophilic urbanism. These are things which we'll see a lot more of, but they still need a lot of demonstrations in R&D, whereas the other ones are ready to go and they're going to be accelerated now. So these three, solar with batteries, electromobility with batteries, and smart city integration. These are the ones that are now taking off. And they're called a cluster of innovation. Schumpeter called them that uh, in the 30s. And well, we had a cluster of these innovations and they all needed fossil fuels last time. Now we're gonna get over it. And you can see this, uh, dramatic change that's happened just due to the COVID collapse. Coal has just about fallen off a cliff in the US and renewables dramatically increased, but that's happened in all OECD nations, 41 of them, including Australia. Coal is down 22%, solar up 16% because the marginal cost of renewables is so much cheaper. And if the demand is down, you go for the lowest marginal cost. So that's why we got this big change happening already. And electromobility is part of this. So we've had a huge increase in this micro mobility. You can't buy these new electric bikes and electric scooters and, and skateboards they're taking off uh, because they're local and useful and electric. Uh, the same is happening with electric vehicles. Tesla's now the biggest, uh, has the biggest shareholding because of its uh, amazing growth that's happening. And these mid-tier transit systems, the small and largish buses, buses and the, the trackless trams. Now, each of them uh, can fit into cities or we can have just totally smarter cities are based around the automobile. And that's not very smart as far as I can see. Smart, a smart transit city, however, will use all of these new apps and machine learning and, and lots of sensors around the city to help transit work better and to help cycling and walking. And this is the, the, the future we have to choose. These, these are the answers to the questions that we need to ask, as Crystal has said. Let me just quickly show you the trackless tram video. This, this was made with Greenpeace in Europe and it took off and it's only a minute long, but it, it, it's had six million hits. charged at stations in, in a fully solar way. It's an extraordinary vehicle, but it's a tenth of the price of a light one. Now this is a major breakthrough, and I would predict that uh, hundreds of cities are rapidly gonna demonstrate this. Uh, and six million did. So that's the... Um, the kind of smartness we're talking about. And those uh, choices need to be made. So we're calling this mid-tier transit. It's not a bus and it's not a train. We actually need all three levels of public transport. Um, but the, this mid-tier, as trams have done in the past in Melbourne in so beautifully, they are a major facilitator of precinct development. 
So we need these centers. Everybody needs centers to relocalize around. So we, we need to build them out in, into the suburbs where they don't have enough of these centers. And most of the local governments out there are saying, that's what we need. We've got plans that say we want a 20 minute city, but how do you do it? You need to provide a technological base that drives it. And if you see each of those centers there, they can have the micro mobility feeding in. You can even have small autonomous shuttles bringing people in, but that's also where you can have solar and uh, the, the with ba battery uh, through the system there, a recharge hub there that can localize these new technologies and make them managed locally. That's the kind of future that is unfolding. Um, so we'll end up with a city that's more like this. Now this is an interesting diagram because my sister is also on this, this call, uh, Carolyn Ingvarsson, who's a climate uh, uh, campaigner from Lighter Footprints. Her son, Daniel, did this for me in the 1990s, this diagram. And it is showing the, the, what we thought then would emerge for the future. We would have so many smaller centers throughout the city, but all linked together with good public transport. This needs the kind of mid-tier stuff that I've been talking about, but also really good heavy rail that goes into and out of the city and around the city. So you can see that the ring rail that's there, and that's the agenda in many cities now, to join together a ring rail system that can make a network across the whole city. So that kind of image, I think, is where we're headed. Relocalised precincts that are created around good public transport. That's our future. Now, I'm going to finish by telling you a quick story because this is what happened in Perth and it's, it's something that I do in my spare time as an activist. Um, we still have to win these visions. It's not enough to write articles in urban science and so on. Now, this is actually a book. It's called Never Again, Reflections on Environmental Responsibility After Row 8. What the heck was Row 8? This was our Tony Abbott uh, freeway, just as you had the East West and Sydney have the horrible West Connex. And there is a, a video made about that and also the, the book because we won this one and it was to be this great horrible thing that was going to go through these wetlands, but it was also going through the middle of Fremantle. It was really an awful, horrible freeway that had not been thought through. It had been designed by a prime minister, which is not a great way to do anything. Um, and we had this massive campaign, which was right up to the last election. Thousands and thousands of people, that's Rosie, row eight's Rosie down there, the elephant, which got stuck in the door of the main roads department and could not be taken out. And massive demonstrations with people like saying, I'm an accountant and I say no to row eight. Um, and we won that because the Labor Party got behind it and uh, this is Mark McGowan with his first announcement after an 18% swing saying he will stop the row eight. So instead of that, the money was taken and put into Metronet. Seven new rail lines are being built in Perth. It's a story that's not often heard about in the East because of course we're only just part of Australia, aren't we? Um, and th this is a, uh, a massive, infrastructure project which includes a ring rail being built now and it includes metro hubs around centres uh, all across the city. So that is what is happening as a result of a major campaign and in many ways you have to win these things in, in a cultural and political way as well as getting all the technical things right. And now we you can see up in the top right the where the bulldozers went in and actually in the weeks leading up to the election, we're knocking down beautiful bushland and you can see the pictures of them there. Uh, that is now being regenerated and restored by local communities and we are going to have a, a major uh, link right across the city from the wetlands to the waves. So sometimes you can win. 
uh, and now we say never again in Perth will we get, do this. So you have to choose the future. You have to ask those right questions, as um, Crystal was saying. Uh, but there are really good solutions and they are emerging rapidly. Thanks very much. Thank you. My computer just froze there. So luckily it came back on. I think there's too many things happening at the same time. Thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation. That was really fantastic. And you have such a wealth of knowledge and so much experience in this, um, in this field. And it was so fantastic to hear that. I, th I think especially that um, what you're talking about in terms of integrating all different modes of transport and that heavy rail mixed with things like trackless trams and other forms of new transport are really, really going to be important in the future and that technology is going to drive this and we're seeing the emergence of lots of new different ways of traveling around the city. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also thought it was really fantastic what you're talking about. Yeah, the power of people and how that um, people coming together can really make a change and make a difference. And I think that really goes off what Crystal was saying, as she said in the comments, um, it's a really good example of politicization. Um, but yeah, it's really fantastic to see so how, how much fantastic um, yeah, work has been done in Perth around stopping, stopping new um, highways and getting better public transport. And I think that um, yeah, is really a fantastic view of what we would love to see here in Melbourne as well in terms of um, really upgrading our rail lines. So um, next I would like to, well, first of all, I'd like to say um, thanks everyone for your questions. Please continue to ask them and we will be answering them all towards the end. Um, and another thing is that um, clearly this event is free and we are a grassroots organisation. If you do, if you are enjoying yourself and you are um, finding this an interesting conversation, please feel free to throw a couple of dollars in our tip jar. Tip jar. Um, Mia will post that link in the chat um, and that money will go towards helping us continue to um, fight for climate justice and continue to um, build our grassroots movement for better public transport in Victoria. So um, without further ado, I will introduce our next speaker. Um, so Daniel Bowen is a campaigner and advocate for improved public transport in Melbourne. He was the president of the Public Transport Users Association from 2003 to 2012 and continues his advocacy as a member of the PTOA committee. He's an IT professional and normally a commuter, a commuter on the Frankston line. He regularly blogs and provides media commentary on transport issues and has a fa fascination with the way cities work. Daniel has been a great support to the Sustainable Cities campaign, and thank you so much for joining us today. Please take it away, Daniel, thank you. Thanks very much, Claudia. Um, hi there, everyone. Uh, I am going to um, give a quick rundown of Melbourne Metro 2, if I can get my slides to work. Hopefully the technology is going to work for me. You've probably all heard of Metro One. Uh, that's the rail tunnel that's currently under construction, um, which will connect the Sunbury Line in the northwest to the Dandenong Line in the southeast. Um, and if, if on uh, per chance you travel through the CBD, um, not many of us are at the moment, but you will see the construction underway there, as well as around Parkville, where it will serve the university and the hospital precinct. Um, and the connection through uh, Kensington to Footscray. So that's the green line there, Metro 1. We've all heard of that. Metro 2 is a concept for a second rail tunnel, um, which would uh, connect the Mernda line in the northeast from uh, going underground at Clifton Hill through Fitzroy and Carlton, uh, Parkville, Flagstaff, Southern Cross, Fisherman's Bend, and then under the river to Newport and connecting through to the Werribee line. And uh, Metro 2 as a, as a concept has been around for a few years now. Um, it doesn't yet really have a great uh, recognition um, from uh, state labor, although uh, 
the, the government has done, you know, the bureaucrats have done a little bit of, of uh, planning around it, but the, the uh, political impetus really hasn't um, uh, lit up yet, uh, unlike Metro 1, which is, is obviously going ahead now and will be uh, completed in the next five or so years. So Metro 2. Um, science work. In the context of the current rail system, this is a, um, a, a diagram which was um, an internal government diagram which was leaked to the media a, a year or two ago and this shows some of the detail of the Metro 2 tunnel. Um, so you can see that there's a proposal proposals for stations in Fitzroy and Carlton so that would um, bring um, mass transit access uh, into those areas which are currently served by trams and buses so um, greater capacity greater speed journey from the inner northern suburbs um, Parkville interchange with uh, the Metro one tunnel currently under construction so serving the hospital and the university precinct uh, Flagstaff in the CBD for obviously interchange with all uh, many of the other lines but also access to um, parts of the CBD and Southern Cross and importantly um, as as the line heads further west uh, one or more stops in Fisherman's Bend uh, now Fisherman's Bend um, as you're probably aware is a huge urban renewal project that's likely to take off in the next few years and um, the current you know currently it's uh, a little bit of residential and a little bit of aging industrial kind of land but that's um, set to skyrocket in terms of commercial and residential development in coming years. And currently it's really only served by a couple of buses plus uh, I think one tram line around the, the southern end of, of that area. Um, there are plans for more tram lines um, and, and possibly you know, increased bus service, but really a development of that size, it's going to become critical to provide uh, higher capacity um, mass transit into that area. Um, under the river and then connecting to Newport where you'd have interchange uh, with the existing Altona Loop line and Williamstown line and then connect, uh, connecting straight through to the current Werribee line and out to out to Werribee. And uh, as mentioned earlier, um, I think the was it? Uh, there are proposals to extend that Werribee line through to Wyndham Vale to connect to the station there to, to better serve that area and, and connect to the existing um, regional line through Tarnik and Wyndham Vale. So, I mean, that's it's a big project, obviously, but uh, it brings a number of benefits um, if, if the project goes ahead. Uh, as I said, mass transit access into Fisherman's Bend, Carlton, and Fitzroy. Um, Calton and Fitzroy are obviously uh, two areas where currently if you're uh, getting around, you, you might be cycling, you might be uh, catching a tram, which is likely to be caught in traffic because most of the tram routes, uh, apart from the 96, don't have dedicated uh, tram lanes. Even if they do, um, the traffic light priority is often very poor. Uh, now that should be resolved, but uh, bringing mass transit access um, to that area as well as to Fisherman's Bend um, would be of huge benefit. Fishman's Bend, I think we can see that uh, such a, a large area so close to the city um, with uh, large numbers of high-rise buildings planned for it. Um, if you think of South Bank, but more distant from the city, so not without the walking, um, the walking distance to the CBD that South Bank has, that's what Fishman's Bend could become. And the, I think the, res the result is pretty predictable. If, if mass transit isn't provided in Fisherman's Bend, you will see large numbers of people moving, moving into the residential developments, but also um, accessing the commercial developments uh, in their cars um, because the, the speed uh, of the existing options just isn't there. Um, Metro 2 would also benefit the people on the Werribee and Murder lines. Obviously, those, those lines would be connected through the tunnel, and that would mean a more direct trip um, into the city and across the city from those lines. If you think of the uh, Werribee line commute now, it comes in from the southwest. Uh, when it gets to Newport, it actually uh, heads north via Footscray, um, which obviously provides access into those areas, but it also means that it's a long detour into the city um, via uh, uh, virtually going around the bay and following the river. 
So a more direct route from Werribee, uh, a more direct route from Mernda. Those trains currently come in uh, head south uh, to, through Richmond and then head uh, into the CBD from there. So a more direct route there as well. Um, capacity. Uh, each of these rail tunnels uh, brings uh, enormous capacity benefits. And we're seeing that with Metro 1. That's separating out the Sunbury line from the city loop, which means uh, it provides a boost on the Sunbury line and the other lines, the same with the Daniel line. The Metro 2 tunnel would boost capacity uh, obviously on the Werribee and Mernda lines because they're the ones directly serving it, but it also frees up existing tracks which carry the Williamstown and Altona lines as well as the Hurstbridge line. Um, so it allows uh, capacity to keep increasing. Um, I think obviously the current situation means that uh, not that many people are using um, public transport, but if, if we look beyond the current crisis, we would have to have Faith, I think that in, uh, in the in the future things will get back to normal and the growth will continue, um, and uh, that that capacity will be needed at some stage. Particularly as Werribee and Mernda, in um, specifically, are uh, uh, big growth areas. Um, City of Wyndham, which is centred around Werribee, has huge numbers of residents moving in, and the, um, the train capacity there is just being absolutely smashed uh, normally in peak hour. With crowding, it's the same on the Mernda line um, as well. Uh, the capacity boost also opens up options for um, additional uh, branches off the existing lines, and two that have been um, have been proposed for quite a while include the Doncaster line branching off the Hurstbridge line, um, and the uh, Wallace or Epping North branch off the Mernda line. So. Uh, the capacity boost would um, allow uh, more trains to run and thus make those sorts of uh, projects uh, uh, an easier option. Um, they're potentially tricky now because uh, of uh, capacity um, constraints on the existing uh, tracks. The, uh, I've included DART there because it, uh, it, the, apart from the Doncaster line option, it also opens up the possibility of the uh, Doncaster Area Rapid Transit, uh, DART, bus, smart bus services from Doncaster. Currently they come down the Eastern Freeway and head into the city, but there would be options there to instead have them uh, connect with the uh, trains at the new station at Fitzroy and have people interchanging onto the train so that the currently what is the slowest part of their journey into the city uh, along uh, Hoddle Street and Victoria Parade. Um, can be sped up by getting them onto the train system instead. So there are options there that are opened up um, if Metro 2 would, would go ahead. There's also been proposals to reroute the Geelong trains uh, onto this tunnel, um, which would provide a more direct route. Um, in, currently, the Geelong trains come up from the southwest and they divert through Wyndham Vale and Tarnit and obviously serve those communities and then up through Sunshine and Footscray into the city. Uh, one proposal sees them using the Metro 2 tunnel as well and uh, sharing the tunnel portion of the track with the Werribee trains and again then thus getting a, a direct route into Southern Cross that way, so speeding up those journeys. Um, that then has capacity benefits for that line as well as for the existing tracks that carry the, uh, the, the Geelong trains currently share with Ballarat Bendigo and potentially airport line trains. So um, in terms of capacity, Metro 2 actually um, brings a whole range of benefits. Um, you need obviously a large range of benefits from these big projects because these mega projects do cost billions and billions of dollars. So you need to look at uh, how much benefit you can get out of, out of uh, such a huge infrastructure project. And it, you know, it does appear that there are wide-ranging benefits for, um, for uh, capacity and speed and uh, urban development right across the, um, the southwest and the northeast of Melbourne. Um, we talk about these big rail tunnels, but it's also important to consider other aspects of them. It's not just about infrastructure. It's also about the timetabling, the frequent services, um, Many of these issues can actually be resolved here and now. Uh, if you look at a Werribee line timetable, if you only travel in peak, there's a train about every 10 minutes, it'll be crowded, but at least you're not waiting very long. 
It's a completely different story if you want to take that journey on, say, a Sunday morning where the train might only be every 40 minutes, which is ridiculous in a, uh, a city of 5 million in the 21st century. That can be solved right now, but it, when we talk about these big infrastructure projects, it, it is really important, I think, to uh, consider the, um, the uh, soft parts of those, those projects and make sure that we're not just building a huge tunnel and then running a train still only every 40 minutes on a Sunday morning uh, through that tunnel. Uh, so it's important to look at uh, ensuring that there's a frequent service provided at all times, which really is, is what Melbourne needs uh, on its uh, heavy rail service to provide that uh, kind of uh, certainty of, of waiting times, better connections, and ensuring that uh, the, the spine, the, the, the backbone of the public transport network really provides um, a better service. And it's also really important, and I, I saw this referenced in the comments earlier, to provide good local connections because it's not all about just getting on the train and uh, traveling on the heavy rail connection. And, it, and Peter mentioned it as well. It's, it's really important to have those local connections, um, not just for uh, trips to the station to access the service, but also to um, make local trips as well when they're needed. Um, if you look at a, a map, and this is, this is the Southwest uh, looking at Werribee um, and the Wyndham uh, area, there's a lot of bus routes, but many of them are infrequent. Uh, a lot of them only run every uh, 30 to 40 minutes most of the day. Um, <clears throat> that's not uh, a good enough frequency to be time competitive for getting to the station. And so you see uh, increasing pressure instead on station car parks. And look, station car parks are only ever going to uh, uh, be a solution for a limited number of people because they take up so much space and they're so expensive to build. Um, you may have seen uh, a few months ago, um, before the COVID crisis, obviously, the ABC ran a, a really interesting story um, around Tarnit Station, uh, which is just off the map uh, up here, uh, uh, where, which is a growing area. There's a lot of train commuters. Most of them arrive at the station by car. Uh, they showed some incredible footage of people getting off the train and running along the platform through the car park to get to their car so that they didn't get caught in a traffic jam trying to leave the station car park. So that's the, the kind of um, almost ridiculous situation that uh, current policies have built for these areas where, yes, you might have your train, but it's not within walking distance and the bus is infrequent and the bike paths are non-existent and the footpaths aren't very good either. Um, so if you want to get on a train, you first have to own a car and get in that car and drive to the station. That's self-defeating. It's always of limited capacity. You get these localised traffic jams and you're really only uh, bringing car dependence a little bit closer to uh, the rail network. You're not uh, removing that car dependence for those families who still end up having to own multiple cars in the driveway, which they're then paying for. Um, even though their, their train ticket would include the local bus, the local bus is not good enough for them to use. So it's really important when we talk about Metro 2 and these big infrastructure projects that we also talk about the local connections into communities so that um, everyone in the area, not just the people that walk, uh, walk to the station, everyone in the area can access um, those train services. And I might leave it there. Um, so hopefully that's useful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was a really fantastic overview of what the Melbourne Metro 2 is and how these issues are even more complex than just adding a new rail line. It is about making sure we do have frequent services and optimising the transport that we have already in place. Um, I, think, I think what that also brought to mind was the idea of creating a more resilient city post-COVID-19. I think that having more transport will help ensure people can and like more frequent services will help ensure people can socially distance and um, yeah, and that, that our cities are full of people who have been walking to the train to the train and therefore have a better immune system because they've, um, they've been doing daily exercise and those kind of things. So um, yeah, I found that really interesting. Um, and yeah, that those videos of people in Tarnit running to their cars 
like after they've got off the train is just such a it's such a show and such a good example of how um how easily we could fix so, so many of the transport issues that we're facing at the moment so thank you so much for your presentation um, I'd just like to mention again, um, thank you everyone who's been posting questions, keep them coming. We're, um, we're collating those and we'll be choosing some at the end of our conversation. And again, if you are enjoying this evening, um, please do think about potentially donating. Um, we'll have a link to a little tip jar in the comments in the chat. Um, and yeah, we are a grassroots organisation um, and yeah, we, we'd love to keep doing this fantastic work and putting on events like this for, for everyone. So if you can chip in a couple of dollars, please do so. Um, so next up we have Jody Valpier, who um, I'm very excited to, to um, introduce to you all. But just to, um, to preface this, I'd like to mention that, of course, we're talking about um, Melbourne Metro 2, which again would would um, be a, it would be a tunnel project that would probably produce um, a lot of soil waste. And Jody's um, Jody's community has currently been fighting back against um, dumping of toxic soil from the Westgate Tunnel in her area. And I think that with any project, um, and what we've seen happen with the Westgate Tunnel is really a um, total mismanagement and um, a really poorly done environmental effects process. And with any large project like this, of course, it wouldn't have community backing unless it did really go through the protocols to ensure that um, no communities would be exposed to any sort of toxic waste. Um, so I just wanted to preface our next part of the conversation with that and say that, yeah, of course, um, communities are obviously at the centre of all of the work that we do and, and we work with communities and that's what we do. So. Um, any sort of risk that would be put towards communities would obviously not be, would not be okay. So um, I'd like to introduce Jody, who is a psychologist, an academic researcher, a teacher, a community member and advocate who lives in Bacchus Marsh, Victoria. She's currently acting chair of the Moorabool Environment Group and president of Bacchus Marsh Platypus Alliance. She has a strong interest in interactions between people and the environment and the benefits of healthy ecosystems for community well-being. Thank you so much, Jody. Take it away. Just unmute. Uh, thank you, Claudia, very much. Um, I have some slides to share, so I'll get those uh, up and running. Okay, so as Claudia mentioned, um, I'm from Mirable Environment Group and also Bacchus Marsh Platypus Alliance. Um, and I'm going to talk today about some of the public transport needs around Bacchus Marsh, uh, but also about the issues that Claudia mentioned um, with the Westgate Tunnel Project, um, which I think again highlight the need for a focus on public transport and not on these big giant road projects that create a lot of issues. Um, just a, a little outline of where Bacchus Marsh is. So um, I've highlighted the area there. Uh, to the east, you can see Melbourne. Um, Melbourne's increasingly sprawling suburbs. Um, to the west, you can see Ballarat. We're basically halfway between Ballarat and Melbourne, um, and also equidistant distant to Geelong as well. Um, and one thing that I'll point out on this uh, map is also we're kind of nestled between the Lederdurg State Park and the Wombat Forest area, uh, Brisbane Ranges, uh, Werribee Gorge, um, just a bit north of the New Yangs, um, in a very, I guess, special valley along the Werribee River and, um, and Lederdurg River area. Uh, we're one of Victoria's fastest growing regional towns. Um, and Travel to work is mostly by private car, probably because a lot of people work locally. Um, most people who work in Melbourne would catch the train, um, but that's got some issues associated with it that I will go into. Uh, so we do have a V-line train from Ballarat to Melbourne that stops at Bacchus Marsh um, and three bus services, um, but we need more direct public transport as well. 
um, and we have some issues that I'll go through here. Uh, so one of the issues that we're facing is uh, a lot of urban development around our area, particularly big greenfield urban development, often in areas that probably aren't all that appropriate for urban development and they tend to be very car-centric developments that um, aren't necessarily connected with public transport. This has led to a push for bigger and better roads, obviously, because we're getting more and more cars on those roads. Um, an increase in traffic movements around town and congestion. And also something that I've really noticed because I live close into town, um, huge increase in traffic noise as well, uh, which is really spoiling the character of what, what is quite a special area here. Um, that background photo, which is from Mobile News a few years ago, uh, I just thought I'd put up as an example of some of the road projects that are happening here. Um, under that road is Werribee River. Um, this is actually a platypus hotspot under there. Um, there was not really much consultation uh, with environmental groups about that, and it's um, and now an area that collects a lot of litter um, coming around those places and upsetting platypus habitats and so on. Um, that was a direct result of um, urban development around those areas and needing a bigger road um, and another access point across the river. Um, the other, another example of kind of road pressures that are, are facing Backers Marsh, um, the area I've highlighted in red, um, just kind of, I guess, the south part of that area is in much for another major development, uh, which has created problems around needing um, another big road uh, to bypass uh, some of the other roads around Bacchus Marsh um, and Vic Roads is really struggling to find a um, suitable place because it, it cuts down the side of Long Forest Conservation Reserve which is a really important wildlife area um, and yeah there's, there's basically nowhere, not many options to put that road that won't cause either environmental destruction or social destruction of places like the Avenue of Honor. Um, so these are the kind of issues when very car-centric um, developments happen. Uh, issues that we're facing around train services, um, it's a single line in some places along this train line. So trains have to wait for others to pass. That creates problems with timetabling and trains running late. Um, increase in number of commuters, overcrowding of trains. Again, it's very CBD centric. Um, very difficult to travel from Bacchus Marsh to other suburbs or towns around the area. You kind of have to go into the CBD and then out again. Um, <clears throat> and no trains between, or so that should say uh, no public transport between um, major areas. So there's a train from Bacchus Marsh to Melton, but it's not in the central area. So you then have to catch buses and it can take all day basically. Um, Bacchus Marsh station has been turned into a big park and ride station, which in one way could have benefits, but in another way it'd be better as previous speakers were saying to have buses connected because what they've done to do that is they've knocked down existing trees um, that were there, quite old trees, created a big tarmac heat bank basically um, in what was a nice historic station. Now it looks a little bit like a, um, a factory area or something. Um, as I said, buses don't meet all train services um, and also don't service some important areas. Um, also, uh, travel between places like Backers Marsh and Gisborne, um, not really any bus services there. Um, and yeah, better bus services would basically benefit the whole community. Backers Marsh is the perfect size for cycling around. You can actually walk from one end to the other in an hour and a half or so. Um, cycling would be perfect, but there's 
little set up to assist cyclists at this stage. There's been some vague plans, but not really put in place. Um, again, with the areas that are developing, becoming very kind of car centric and not well serviced um, for public transport, that has a slow on effect for making it difficult for cyclists as well. So it's kind of a compounding effect, I guess. Um, where at the moment it's becoming more and more unsafe to ride on um, the roads around Buckers Marsh so that are becoming in, in, um, congested. So uh, some of the um, Melbourne Metro 2 benefits that have already been mentioned, um, it would make it easier for people in the West to kind of Cut across to different suburbs without having, without this kind of focus just on the getting to the CBD and back. Um, we might want to go to places that aren't the CBD um, and having more, more kind of cross city um, connections will help with that. Also, actually, decrease the amount of people trying to use the one rail line. Um, because that's one of the issues that our trains face at the moment is of course having to work in with other trains that are really busy, lots of people getting on the train so that it becomes incredibly crowded by the time it's into the inner west um, and also obviously having to wait for other trains and things like that. So um, it would have benefits in that sense as well. Um, as Claudia was mentioning, um, they're always, it's, it's important, I guess, to be starting off from an environmentally conscious place from the beginning. And that's where I think that it's really good that organisations like Friends of the Earth are getting on board and advocating for this so that they've got um, some element <clears throat> of advocacy and control from the start um, to make sure that infrastructure planning is done in an environmentally conscious way. Um, we've also seen with some of the removal of level crossings and stuff around Melbourne, um, there was one area that had uh, swift parrot uh, habitat removed to make a, an overpass and different things like that. So having environmental groups involved from the start um, will really help advocate making sure that the environmental benefits of public transport aren't being kind of undermined or um, yeah, by uh, other environmentally damaging decisions around that. So it should be possible to, um, to be environmentally conscious in developing these things. Uh, which brings me to um, talking a little bit about one of the issues we're facing here. And I think aside from all the other uh, road kind of big road project issues that we're having around here and the impacts on the environment both in terms of emissions and in terms of um, these roads going through environmentally sensitive areas is also the when you make a road particularly in places like the Westgate Tunnel where you're needing to dig big holes um, in previous industrial areas um, the amount of excavation that you need to do for those big roads is much bigger than the amount that you need to do to build a train line because obviously the roads have to be a lot wider. Um, unfortunately with the Westgate Tunnel, as you've probably heard, uh, they've come across um, PFAS and other industrial chemicals that they really kind of knew from the start. but. Um, didn't plan effectively for. Um, unfortunately, uh, Backers Marsh has become uh, embroiled in this because we have a um, facility really right next to Backers Marsh. In fact, as the crow flies pretty much close behind our railway station, um, which is you know right in the next to the residential area, uh, that would like to make a lot of money um, out of receiving that spoil but is in a completely inappropriate location. Um, so this is kind of part of the area where they're planning to receive PFAS contaminated spoil from the Westgate Tunnel project. 
Um, the reason I show this is that the media often reports that um, they want to put it in an old mine. They own an old mine, but the area that they're putting it in is not, it, it's paddocks basically, um, which sit on top of a uh, hilly area above Parliament Creek, which I'll show you on the map in a moment, but it, it's not their existing landfill area. It's basically an expansion of around 130 hectares, uh, which would make their facility uh, almost as wide as the main part of the Backers Marsh town. So this is a little bit of a map. Um, the area with the red border around it is kind of the main part of Backers Marsh, I guess the historic area. Um, the yellow is the kind of expanded area. Uh, green is where your vegetables are grown. If you eat lettuce and um, uh, baby spinach and things like that, a, a really high percentage of the stuff that goes throughout Victoria um, and Australia um, comes from that kind of irrigation valley there. Um, the pink triangle is a school, um, a P to 12 school. Uh, the black blob is uh, the landfill um, which was in an old coal mine but has turned into a landfill. Um, and the red area is where they want to put the PFAS contaminated spoil. Um, as you can see, there's seasonal water courses that run through that and the river right next door. Uh, growling grass frogs all along that creek um, and probably on the site. Uh, lots and lots of birds of prey and stuff using that area as well, including birds that are protected um, in Victoria um, and some birds that are protected nationally as well. Um, I won't go through all these in detail because I'm running short of time, but uh, all the sensitive receptors that are listed for where PFAS should not be stored, um, the site basically has all of those. Um, the PFAS levels we keep being told are expected to be low, although leaked results would suggest that's possibly not really the case. But PFAS bioaccumulates um, in water and in people and in vegetables. Uh, so those levels can become high through repeated exposure and also biomagnifies in the food chain, um, putting those species um, at very big risk. We've done a, a lot of research and in fact amphibians and birds of prey are some of the most sensitive. Um, the levels it, it can have effects at, at, at very, very low levels of PFAS. Uh, that's a bird of prey <laughs> flying over the existing site. Um, it basically, and you know, I, I think this is one thing that ties in the whole whole thing when with governments and organisations trying to save money when they're skimping on public transport or skimping on uh, following environmental um, guidelines properly um, to save money they're basically shifting the cost to the community. So I guess our big message is um, holding governments accountable and private enterprises accountable and making them realise that if they're trying to save money um, to do something that's less than ideal, um, it's actually community members um, and the community, that cost doesn't go away. It ends up, ends up being us who um, pays the price both literally and figuratively at the end of the day. If you'd like further information or to touch base, um, or if you'd like to, if you think you know you can help us out in any way in, in the uh, all the work we're doing, which is many hundreds and hundreds of hours of work uh, about the contaminated spoil and trying to pr protect the endangered species around those areas, then uh, please drop us a line. But uh, yeah, thank you, Claudia, for the opportunity. And I should clarify just um, because otherwise the psychology board gets upset. I'm a psychology researcher, not a psychologist, just to make sure they don't get upset. <laughs> but thank you so much for the opportunity and for the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Jodie. Sorry about that. I, I must have <laughs> read it, but um, 
um, every, everybody does it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Basically, you're, yeah, you've got a fantastic resume. So thank you so much for coming <laughs> today. And um, thank you so much for, for your presentation. I think, um, yeah, I think it was really interesting to see the impacts um, that um, your community is facing when it comes to transport issues and also when it comes to that constant, um, I guess that constant silencing of community voices that we see, um, we're seeing it as well in our, in our campaigns to stop the North East Link toll road. Um, and we kind of see it across the board where community voices are just not heard when it comes to these things. And it's so important to make sure that we're not exposing people to dangerous, um, yeah, dangerous um, PFAS and other contaminants. And also similarly with roads, um, we're seeing an increase in um, air pollution and other issues around health as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been fantastic to have you. Um, you. We'll, we'll, we'll start um, opening up the floor for questions in a minute, but first of all, um, I would like to just remind everyone again that um, if you are enjoying the event, um, there is a tip jar that you are very welcome to donate to, to help us keep this grassroots work going. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. It's been really fantastic. And we will, we will wrap it up in a little while, but first of all, I'm very excited to read out some, or to invite some of these um, audience members to read out their questions. First of all, I will go to um, Shongjen Li and see if maybe they would like to read out their question. If you feel comfortable, you're welcome to um, turn on your video and that way um, we will see you on the live stream as well. Um, so Shongjen, would you like to um, read out your question? Oh, hi everyone. Yeah, sure. So I think my question was around how COVID would change our travel behavior and um, whether mass transit, uh, hi, whether mass transit would still play the same role. Um, and yeah, how do we rebalance the uh, funding on different trans modes of transport? Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I might throw this one to Crystal and then we can see if any of the other panellists would like to answer as well. Thanks for the question. I mean, it's a, such a good one. It's so um, um, relevant. And unfortunately, I don't think there are a lot of answers available. I think everything is changing so rapidly and so um, with, with so much uncertainty, we don't really know where it's all going to lead us. What's interesting, though, is in the context of our conversation, um, we the, the presentations and the and the scope of our discussion tonight could have happened before COVID, and and so one of the things I really want to challenge is how we think about infrastructure provision, be that Melbourne Metro Two, suburban rail loop, or anything else, can can be reframed in the context of what we're going through today. And, and for me, the only answer that I can offer to your question is for all of us to look internally and think for ourselves, how are we going to change our mobility patterns? I mean, how many of us are eager to, to make that commute back into the workplace? And if that workplace is in the center of the city, how, how committed and how keen are you to get back out there and doing that five days a week during peak hour? Or perhaps your relationship with your workplace has shifted. Perhaps your employer's expectation of you is shifting. I mean, these are really interesting questions that I think are live and remain unanswered. But it's really up to us to challenge the boundaries because I think the shaping of transport into the future is really an open question and it's for us to dictate. Thank you so much, Crystal. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that as well and how much I might be able to work from home or how, how our lives are going to be so drastically changed post COVID-19. Did any of the other panellists want to answer that question? Peter? Yeah, just quickly. The, uh, the problem is that behaviour is usually factored around time and cost. Uh, with, and, and, and transport follows that 
more than it does health. And I, I think that uh, as we come out of this crisis, uh, those big structural things will continue because you won't be able to take a car replacing mass transit because the roads will fill so dramatically, even more than they are. You won't be able to take a bike for an hour and a half when you had a 30 minute rail journey. You will take the train again. The, the reality is time and cost will are structured into our lives so much and the city doesn't change that overnight. So your behavior will change it at the margins only. Um, and, and there will be more localised transport possible because I think we are learning to, to work a lot more at home and that can enable, therefore, those localised things to happen. There will be less uh, need for the, the full week to go into the city or to travel long distances. But I think the, uh, our cities are not going to change overnight to being suddenly not needing mass transit. I'm afraid the mass transit is critical for the future of cities. Thank you so much, Peter. Wonderful, and I'll go to another question now. Um, so this one is from Anna Langford. Anna, would you like to read, um, read this question out and perhaps turn on your video? Oh, Anna's audio isn't working. I'll read out the question. Um, so this one is, Melbourne is conti Melbourne's continuing urban sprawl is concerning and makes it less livable for people that live further and further out. How can the state government be convinced to embrace future planning based on closer-knit, well-serviced cities and towns? I might see, Daniel, would you want to give, give that question a bit of a run? Yeah, I mean, um, off the top of my head, look, uh, uh, continuing urban sprawl and the, and the expanding boundary is a real uh, problem. Um, one of the um, one of the key things about making sure that transport networks, and, and particularly public transport networks, continue to function well and and uh, serve residents, is that you don't continually move the goalposts and expand the urban area and that you do uh, make some attempt to consolidate um, development in a, in a defined area um, and continue to uh, grow the, the transport options in those areas. I think one of the things that Melbourne does really badly is uh, opens up new suburbs um, and gets people moving in and doesn't provide a fully rounded set of transport options. Basically, people move in, look at their transport options, discover that there's maybe a lack of footpaths, a lack of bike paths. Um, there's either no public transport or just very infrequent bus services, which take a long time to get to a station and, and a shopping center. Um, they look at all that and they, and they work out that the only practical way of getting around is to buy a car for every person in the family. And, uh, or at least every adult in the family. Um, and you've then set their travel patterns for years to come after that. And it's very hard to then break that um, uh, later on. So it's really key that uh, planners and, and authorities in general um, for these new suburbs, if we must have new suburbs from time to time, that they provide uh, different transport options from day one as residents move in, not 10 years later or 20 years later, when a generation of people have uh, established car-based um, travel patterns and car dependency. Wonderful, thank you so much, Daniel. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We're seeing so many new suburbs being built without any transport at all, any public transport at all. And it's really concerning to see people, yeah, be um, forced into owning a car, which can often be very expensive for families. Um, so thank you so much for that. There are so many fantastic questions. I'm trying to figure out which ones are the best. Um, but I might throw one to Jody quickly. Um, there's, there's two questions here that um, are for you. First one is, um, is there a petition to stop the contaminated soil dump? Um, maybe I can send around in an email some further follow-up about how people can get involved in that campaign. 
And the other one is, um, if PFAS doesn't go to Bacchus Marsh, where should it go instead? And I think this is kind of leading to a bigger question around um, the management of soil, contaminated soil in general. But um, if someone was to ask you that question, what, what, is your, what are your groups saying around that? Um, and what would you say? Yeah. Uh, yeah, both really good questions. I'll answer the second one first. Um, when the Westgate Tunnel project was being planned, um, the consultants, Golder Associates, looked into where the contaminated spoil could go. Um, and they actually came up with a list of sites. Um, and some of those are uh, sites that are purpose made for dealing with uh, PFAS contaminated spoil, so they have experience in that area. Um, and the, yeah, so, so that was an option and it was actually signed off on um, and everything, but somehow things went out to tender instead. Um, and we think that the reason for that is simply money, um, that Transurban and uh, the builders don't want to pay the amount of money that it costs to dispose of PFAS contaminated soil properly. <laughs> Um, is it, basically the, the um, lowdown of it. So there are facilities that are away from waterways, um, away from human populations, away from food growing areas, schools, all that sort of thing um, that, that are already established um, and that have good track records. Um, yeah, and, and that's where it should be going. What Victoria needs though is really a um, proper management plan for PFAS. Um, instead, what's happened at the moment is that the government has introduced uh, regulations kind of just in the past couple of weeks without running them by Parliament, because Parliament's not sitting, uh, that overrides the Environment Protection Act, um, which is something that anybody interested in environmental protection should probably um, be very, very concerned of about because they they basically have, have overridden uh, existing legislation uh, to allow disposal of that um, tunnel boring spoil uh, without a licence. It just has to have an environmental management plan signed off on. Um, and we know from experience that that uh, means very little usually at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, we, we need a, a statewide strategy, uh, but there have been other places where it, this lot could have gone. Um, it just comes down to money at the end of the day. Um, and, and, you know, corporate greed probably, to put it, to put it bluntly. Uh, we did have a petition that has been tabled with Parliament. Um, we haven't heard back from that, but we are asking people to write to the planning minister, um, to the EPA, to DELT and anyone else. So, um, and we might have an online petition again. So I can probably pass on details of that to Claudia. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you can uh, write letters. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jodie. Yes, I'll pass on that information to all the attendees and I'll post it on our social media as well. Um, Wonderful. So there's a couple more minutes. So I thought this was a really fantastic question. Um, and I might ask the, the person who's written it to, to turn on their, um, their video and microphone if they feel comfortable. Um, Nivedita Ravidran, would you like to ask your question? I thought that was a really interesting one. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for being here. It was a really wonderful session. Um, so my question was regarding the uh, importance of public transport, not only in the CBD, but also in the surrounding regional areas. And this might increase because of the pandemic, because uh, me including, I mean, I'm also considering jobs that uh, are possible in outer areas and not just in the CBD. And that might be, ex um, you know, more. Uh, prevalent because of this pandemic, people are not feeling safe uh, working in close proximity, uh, which is what is happening in the CBD. So how to uh, service this public transport network um, in areas that might become the new normal as like uh, polycentric cities evolve uh, after the pandemic? Would any of our panelists like to answer that question? 
Peter, and then Crystal. Great, Peter first. Yeah, look, I think the um, relocalizing of centres uh, will continue because it's something that we've wanted and needed before the pandemic, and the pandemic does help drive it. I don't think that there is actually a case for saying that density is a is worse for pandemics uh, like this. It has been said, uh, but it's often said by people who just want to keep the sprawl going, um, because there's there's considerable uh, infection in Melbourne's outer suburbs. Uh, it's not uh, just those high-rise towers. There was only one high-rise tower, mostly. Um, so if it was density, then it would have been all of them. Uh, Korea, uh, South Korea, um, Seoul and cities like that have managed. They're very dense and they've not uh, had the, the, the COVID outbreaks that other places have had. It's a matter of overcrowding and it's a matter of mis, um, uh, mismanagement uh, that, that just neglects to consider the, the obvious hygienic things that have to be done in pandemics. But certainly in terms of the future, we need to create more relocalised employment and services um, throughout the city. And the, the um, need for that is there. Melbourne doesn't do it as well as Sydney does. There's a lot more work out in those centres around the, the city. Um, and uh, it, it is something that can uh, definitely be part of the next 20, 30 years of, of employment growth, of, of uh, servicing and creating our, our city. Um, and one of the reasons Melbourne doesn't do that is because the central area is so beautiful and so well done. I mean, it is a fantastic place to go to. It's still, you know, a very livable, walkable city. It's got those beautiful public transport options and it's got tree-lined streets and lots of coffee shops and all the things that attract you to the city as well as the work. So you need to make really attractive centres that are able to compete with that as well as just having the work and the key things like shops and so on there. It's got to be really well done uh, if you're going to get people out of those areas. And I, I think it can happen, but uh, it's, it's, it's a slow process and one that needs to be committed to and, and uh, governments need to back it as well as industries. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. Crystal, did you have something to add to that? Um, I was just going to say on sort of the theme of politicisation, I think we should really back the government's policy of a 20-minute city. I mean, the policy is there. We need to raise our voices and start saying that this is something we actually want. You know, well done. Keep going. And we have, we've had some fantastic interventions by people like Ian Laurie and John Stone talking about the importance of buses, pop-up bus lanes. Extraordinary. Um, I mean, these are really great ideas, you know, straightening out our bus network it can serve our suburbs so, so well. We have the knowledge, we have the capacity, we just don't do it. And this really comes down to the point that I was trying to raise in my little talk, which is the role of politicization, the role of our collective voice. Uh, in getting behind these policies, especially when they come from government. Government came up with that policy. <laughs> let's, you know, um, let's celebrate that. We often will, you know, we often will resist government ideas. This, I think, may actually be a good one. Thank you so much, Crystal. And that really well leads us into the very last question, which is. Um, to get better public transport infrastructure and services, how do we get the majority of Victorians to get behind the fight for better public transport in Melbourne and the regions? And I thought that I would maybe maybe answer this question um, because that's the work that we do here at Friends of the Earth. Um, and I think the we've we've seen it happen time and time again. We saw it with um, stopping the East West Link. We've seen it in Perth. We've seen it. We've seen it all around the world. Collective action and collective power does work. And getting involved with your with your um, 
yeah, with your local organisation, whether that's Friends of the Earth, whether that's another one, getting involved with um, collectives and, um, and yeah, with organisations that are doing the work that you want to see done and leading by example is a really fantastic way to grow the movement. And when people see, people you love see you doing this work, they will also be inspired to join or inspired to go and do out and go out and do that work um, to make, to make the world a better place, whether that's in the transport sphere or in other spheres as well. Um, so we're going to have to wrap it up because it is just on 7.30. Um, but I, I would love to just quickly um, go over some of the themes that came up throughout the night. Um, I think one of the big ones was that ongoing question about who makes the decisions about the world we live in, about the places that we live and work. And how do we bring that power back into the into the hands of the people? And I think that um, that's something that's really kind of resonated with me, and that's a constant a constant um, concept that comes up in pl in the planning sphere. Um, another one that came up was um, around health issues and how that how the way that we um, the way that we travel around and our modes of transport can really impact and have a um, a really positive or negative impact on our health and that's really evident especially during a pandemic at the moment. Another one is was innovation and technology and the, the diversity in modes of transport that we're seeing happening at the moment and that um, that we're sure to see more of in the future. And that's very exciting um, and that combination of rail and other modes um, and actually just improving the current network that we have at the moment in Victoria because there is so much potential that could happen um, just by connecting up all the different services in a much better way. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the main things that I took away from it. And I hope that it's inspired others to think more about this and to get involved in the fight for better public transport all across Victoria. Um, I thought it would be cute to do a quick little photo screenshot of everyone if you feel comfortable. Um, so if you'd like to turn on your video, you can. And I thought we could all smile and maybe um, put our hand up in the air like this and we can go on the count of three, we can say public transport. <laughs> and maybe I'll ask Michaela, could you take a screenshot? Awesome, thank you. All right, one, two, three, public transport. Woo! <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I would just like to say a big thank you to um, all of our speakers, Crystal, Peter Newman, Daniel Bowen and jo Jody Valpid. And um, yeah, your, your insights tonight have been really inspiring and, and um, really valuable. So thank you so much. I'd also like to shout out to the Sustainable Cities Collective who helped um, make this event possible. In particular, um, Natasha and Mia who are on tech for the evening and the organizers, Moretta and Michaela, and Cam Lee and um, Anna, who were all on so, um, social media. Thank you so much. Bye. And thank you, Claudia. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. <laughs>